Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our next episode of Rewox Topics and Neuro Rehabilitation webcast. I'm Jill Butler, and today we'll be talking again with Nassim Chariwala. Nassim first appeared on this series in episode two, where she provided some extremely valuable insights into gait analysis and training for neuro rehabilitation. Nassim is a board certified neuroclinical specialist and a certified vestibular clinical specialist who has more than 20 years of experience as a PT treating a variety of complex neurodiagnoses. She works at the Clow Family Center for Rehabilitative and Sports Therapies at Emerson Hospital and also works as an adjunct teaching faculty member at both the MGH Institute of Health Professions and the UMass Lowell Physical Therapy Program as well as a course developer for Summit Professional Education. The theme talk today will dig into the specific challenge of addressing knee hyperextension during gait training. Hi, Naseem. It's great to talk with you today. Thank you, Jill. So, Naseem, I'm actually so glad that you could join us again for this because your first talk was super popular on this series, and I'm so excited to hear you dig deeper on this topic. Knee hyperextension is such a prevalent challenge after stroke in particular, and I know that our viewers are interested to learn more about the underlying causes and potential rehab treatment options to explore. To our viewers, we also love to hear from you about some of the common treatment ideas that you guys use when encountering knee hyperextension as well. So let us know in the comments section, and please remember to like and subscribe if you want to see more talks like this one. With that, Nassim, I'm going to turn things over to you and let you take it from here. All right. Uh, so again, I'm very excited to be here and uh, let's dive a little bit more deeper into this topic of knee hyperextension. And we see this a lot of times in our patient population, especially as a neurologic physical therapist, um, mainly the patient population I see this happening with is stroke. But if you are a sports specialist or a orthopedic uh, specialist, you would be seeing these in a lot of our younger population who play sports and they have ACL injuries or other sports injuries, or sometimes it could just be uh, genetics and you could have somebody having knee hyperextension and how that affects their play and sports. So that's a whole different topic by itself. But today we are really going to address knee hyperextension in a population who have stroke. So the objectives for next 15 minutes, 20 minutes, is uh, really kind of reviewing the traditional ideas and approaches on knee hyperextension, uh, digging in a little bit more into the mechanics of what causes a knee hyperextension, and just giving you a few different treatment ideas on how to address knee hyperextension in patients with stroke. So what is knee hyperextension? and how popular it is. 40 to 60% of our patients with stroke suffer from knee hyperextension. And the biggest problem, lack of agreement on what causes knee hyperextension. So knee hyperextension, also known as genuricular bottom, is when knee joint is forced to extend beyond its point of normal range of motion. Now, when I say force to extend beyond its point of normal range of motion, it could happen rapid or abrupt. We call it a knee thrust, or it could happen slowly. Uh, peak knee angle for knee hyperextension can vary in a patient with stroke. It can be as little as minus two degrees to as high as 22 degrees. So let's review a little bit about what happens during the normal gait process. And then we'll talk a little bit about that knee hyperextension, which happens during the mid stance part of this gait. So we all know are all phases of the gait. And during a loading response and a mid stance, this is where those knee mechanics are very important because this is where the weight gets transferred from a body to the ground. We have to stabilize in that mid stance because that's a single limb support time on our leg so that the other leg can move forward. And if we don't have that stability during that mid stance, our knee, which is supposed to be in about five degrees of flexion, gets into that hyperextension mode. 
So just reviewing a little bit of those joint angles between initial contact loading response and mid stance. And I'll kind of review them again in the next slide. At initial contact, our ankle is in neutral, knee is in extension, hip is in flexion. At loading response, our ankle gets into plantar flexion, our knee gets into flexion, and our hip is still in flexion. And then at mid stance, our ankle goes back in dorsiflexion, knee gets back into extension, and our hip is into extension at this point. And our trunk is kind of an erect posture. And these three things are very, very important. These are like the basis, like a foundation. And then we'll talk a little bit more about those mechanics of knee hyperextension. So if you have heard my previous talk, I talked about gravitational vector forces. And I find this is a very, very important phenomena in gait. And as much as I would like to do it in my clinics with my patients, I know you need to have sensors and you need to have proper sophisticated uh, gait kind of assessment devices, which we don't have in my outpatient clinic. But I'll kind of give you some ideas on how you could do it if you're interested in kind of learning a little bit more about this gravitational vector uh, lines of forces. So basically, again, at initial contact, when I said the ankle is in neutral, knee is in extension, and hip is in flexion. So when we are preparing ourselves to get into that initial contact phase of that gait cycle, basically we're throwing our weight from our body into the floor by that limb going forward. And when we throw this weight into the floor, we have this gravitational vector force, which is equal and opposite force that's going back to our body. And the way the force line represents or works is, it is going around our ankle joint, it's going in front of our knee joint and it's going in front of a hip joint. And this creates passive mechanics in our gait. And the passive mechanics are, because the way the gravitational vector line falls in front of the hip and knee, it creates a hip flexor momentum and a knee extensor momentum. Now, when we get into the loading phase, because our weight is now going forward, the gravitational vector line or the force is now falling behind our knee joint and at our hip joint. So this now, the passive mechanics causes the knee to get into a little bit of flexion because it's going behind the knee and it's kind of right at that hip still. So you still have that hip flexion momentum. Now, when we get to the mid stance part, this is where the weight is still going forward. So now the gravitational vector line goes behind the hip joint. And so we get this passive hip extension. It's still behind the knee joint. So we still have maybe about one or two degrees of flexion, but from that loading phase to mid stance, in loading phase, we had a lot of knee flexion, a lot of meaning five degrees. And now as we get into mid stance, we are having like one or two degrees. And that little flexion, that's our shock absorption. So the forces, when they go from our trunk to our hip to our knee to our ankle, we have this shock absorption built into our knee joint. So for example, this is a patient of mine. She is starting to get this initial strike on this right leg. So it's a heel strike. So basically we know with the heel strike that this gravitational vector line should be behind the knee and kind of right around the hip joint, right? Now from here, she's going to take a step forward. So she goes into this loading response and is getting prepared for that mid stance part. And so you see how the gravitational line is falling on her and what it should be. So if you're looking at this, I wish I could uh, show this to you with a line, but basically you're trying to get this right up over here and right here. So if you think about the knee joint, her knee is pretty good over here. But then if you look at the hip joint, what are you seeing? It's maybe slightly more behind than what 
we could possibly have for her in terms of increasing the efficiency of that gait cycle for her. But her knee looks pretty good. Now she is going past her mid stance into her terminal stance over here. So this is where that gravitational vector line comes in front of that knee joint again. And her knee is holding on pretty well over here. So if you look at this line, it's going pretty well in front of this knee over here in the ankle, but look at where her hip is and where that line would fall. So in her, the line is falling too far anterior than her hip joint versus in this picture where it should be is kind of behind that hip. So this is where the hip extensors really play a role in the gait cycle as well. And then this is where now she has already put a step on her other side. So she is almost ready to have the swing phase on her right leg. And we'll talk about that shorter step. So she walks, she's not getting knee hyperextension, but she walks with a very short step on her left side, which is her uninvolved side. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a few slides. So if you look at this video, and I'm hoping that you can see the video really well. So what happens here when you saw that knee hyperextension? It happened during that mid stance phase of the gait cycle. So think, 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 right? So many things going on here. And I think when we see this knee hyperextension, our focus is on the knee. What's going on at the knee? Which I'm not saying is wrong, but if we look at those previous slides at what should be happening at the ankle, what should be happening at the knee, and then what should be happening at the hip and trunk, everything kind of could be a cause to this person having this knee hyperextension. And for him, the knee hyperextension is, it's, it's a lot. It's almost up to like 15, 20 degrees. So just kind of reviewing a little bit of knee anatomy is why, why do we get this knee hyperextension like minus 22 degrees? That, that's a lot. And how does a knee joint allow that much range of motion without causing these really big problems? I know we get some stretching of ligaments and stuff, but it's not really causing a lot of knee issues in terms of knee pain for these patients who may have stroke. Like we are worried about it. And some people may have knee pain as well. But what it is in the knee joint is we have a lot of these ligaments and cushioning, which could allow for that knee to force that range of motion into hyperextension. So we have that little buffering in this knee joint which allows for that knee hyperextension to happen in that first place. So going back to what causes that knee hyperextension, if you look at that gravitational vector force or vector line, and you think about how it is playing for this patient, you see how far the knee is behind that line. It's going to the ankle. I'm not sure if you're able to see that from this picture, but his ankle is in plantar flexion. He doesn't have ankle dorsiflexion range of motion. If you look at his hip, his hip joint is far behind that line. So his hip extensors are possibly weak as well. It doesn't allow for his weight to transition forward during that mid stance part of the gait. So the little picture I have on the side is these two slices of bread, like I feel it as a sandwich. And I think the meat is the knee joint, right? So we are all concentrating on the knee joint. But I really want everybody to think about what happens above and be below it. So the hip and the ankle, because I feel the hip and the ankle position during the mid stance part of the gait are a big contributor to what happens at that knee joint during that mid stance part of the gait. So going back to what causes generic arvatum or uh, hyperextension, I think one of the biggest thing I hear from everyone when I ask this question is quadricep weakness. Absolutely, I agree with that. 
The second big thing I hear is hamstring weakness. Possibly I don't agree there a lot. I feel yes, hamstring weakness has some things that's contributing, but not a lot. Because if you think about hamstring muscles and that mid stance part of the gait cycle, honestly, it, it doesn't have that much of a role or action during that part. Spasticity in extensors, like the quadricep muscles, yes, absolutely. Weak hip extensors, a big contributor. Because when you have weak hip extensors, now during that loading phase to the mid stance, that's where the hip extensors work concentrically to hold that hip joint to make sure that you have a good trunk and to translate that weight forward. If you don't have strength in those hip extensors, what are you going to do? You're going to lurch forward. And if you lurch forward, you're throwing that leg backwards. So that hip extensors is a big contributor. What about lack of dorsiflexion range of motion? How many of our patients have that? How many of our patients with stroke have that? A lot. And at the same time, hand in hand is our plantar flexion tightness or spasticity in our gastroc muscle and our weakness in our gastroc muscles. These three are a big contributor to your knee hyperextension because what happens during that loading response to the mid stance is during that loading response, we had ankle into our plantar flexion of five degrees. From loading response, as we get into the mid stance, what happens? The ankle is moving into dorsiflexion range of motion. And gastroc muscle is really holding that tibia right underneath that femur eccentrically. And it's working very, very hard to hold that tibia over there. And if we have weakness in that gastroc muscle, what's going to happen as long as we translate from loading response to mid stance, the gastroc muscle is not able to hold that tibia. The tibia snaps back, we get hyperextension, we have a shorter stride on the left side, which is the other side, the uninvolved side, and we take this leg forward. So that weakness of that plantar flexors is another big contributor to somebody exhibiting knee hyperextension. Other issues that we see often in our patients with stroke is proprioceptive issues. Sometimes the patients don't have a feeling. They don't know where that knee is in space. And along those lines, some people have hard time motor planning. And so again, if motor planning is an issue, is that execution is an issue, even though I'm trying to teach my patient what to do during that gait cycle, they may get it at that time, but cognitively or motor planning wise, sequencing wise, if they don't get it, it's very hard to treat that or address that. So I find a big cause of knee hyperextension is not one thing. It's a combination effect. Because on the other side, if your patient only has one problem, like quadricep weakness. So if I had like really poor quad muscle control, but if I have very strong gastroc muscle, if I have good range of motion in my ankle, if my proprioception is fine, if my motor planning is fine, I will be able to compensate for that knee hyperextension. I will not exhibit knee hyperextension. Same way, if I have weak gastroc muscle, but I have very strong quadricep muscles, I may be able to compensate for my weak gastroc muscle. But if I have weak gastroc and a weak quad, there we go. Now we are going to see knee hyperextension. So that combination effect is a big thing. Um, another example. So in this patient, she is wearing an AFO. So unfortunately, I did not have a picture of her without her AFO because you would have seen the knee hyperextension really well. Um, but this one is with uh, AFO. But still, I think you might be able to see a little bit of knee hyperextension um, that she was exhibiting. So if you look at that gravitational vector forces or lines, and this is what I do with most of my patients. So what I was telling you before is uh, in terms of looking at observational gait analysis, I like to take pictures of my patients. And um, once I take the pictures, usually take them on my patient's phone, it's easier, HIPAA guidelines. And then I'll try to draw these dotted lines on where that hip is, where the knee is, and where the ankle is. It just gives me a really nice pictorial uh, 
thing in my head and now it tells me treatment ideas like if you just look at this little figure right here and if i ask what are some of the treatment ideas it comes on very easy for us as a physical therapist uh, working with gait at all times so if you look at her hip you see how far her hip is behind she never gets her hip forward and if she never gets her hip forward that means the weight is not translated forward this is our constant thing with this patient is i'm always telling her try to get that hip forward try to get that trunk forward try to put weight trust your leg bring that weight on that leg if you look at the knee over here this is really trying to get this knee flexion momentum right here during this loading response and then I actually did not have a picture of exact mid stance because she takes such a short step on this right side over here. So by the time that mid stance happens here, the other foot is already. So it's a very short period of that mid stance. And this is what happens. When patients are not able to trust that leg in mid stance, the other leg barely takes a step. It, it's a very, very short step. And that's one of the compensating things that patients with stroke learn to do. And that makes the gait inefficient. We talk about gait speed. We talk about all the other ways in which we measure gait. Um, sorry, I forgot to take these pictures. So um, basically, I'll, I was doing. I was trying to compare to what would be a normal gait. What would we like to see, and where those gravitational vector lines should fall versus what you are seeing in this picture. And I think that big thing again right here is that hip is so far back and we really want to see that hip coming forward while maintaining that knee flexion of one to two degrees. We don't want that knee to get into this hyper extension. Uh, we'll talk about braces a little bit uh, in a couple slides, but that brace really helps her because it's allowing for dorsiflexion and it does not allow for plantar flexion. All right, so I think I talked about this already, but just again, one more time is this hip extensors, I think is a big contributor and we really want to make sure um, that we have hip extension. A lot of our patients don't have hip extensors. Uh, simple exercises, glute squeezes to begin with, get the patient prone line, squeeze your butt muscles. That's what we usually will do with the patients, but then get them up in the loading stages and have them take steps, step ups, uh, marching, whatever we can do to really get strength in those hip extensors, isometric, concentric. Um, one of the studies kind of, there are a couple studies out there, but one of the study looked at which compared uh, pre and post uh, rehabilitation on the knee mechanics. And so this is a pre-training, which is on the top uh, row, and then the post-training is on the bottom row. And if you look at that gravitational vector line in this peak loading response and terminal extension, so you see how there was knee hyperextension by minus 17 degrees. Just by doing some specific, task-specific exercises to work on that loading phase of the gait, to maintain knee flexion, to get hip extension, to work on strengthening the ankle muscles, uh, lots of squats, lots of lunges. Uh, they were able to actually get that knee to maintain in around 11.1 .1 degrees of knee flexion during the mid stance part of the gait cycle. So there is hope. And uh, I think we just need to train our patients to be able to kind of work in this uh, mid stance part of the gait cycle. So some of the treatment ideas that I would recommend is if we see patients who are exhibiting knee hyperextension, there are multiple different things that we could work on. And I think sometimes the biggest thing we want to work on is address the knee because it's knee hyperextension. But as I said about that sandwich model, right? We want to really address ankle and the hip first, hip and trunk, before we get into the knee. So trunk, really try to get that posture. I think we do this anyways with all of our patients. We're always telling them to sit up straight, stand up straight, uh, walk straight. Um, so avoid the forward loading position. Uh, we don't want that hip lurching or trunk lurching. Hip, we don't want to have too much hip flexion. And that's what a lot of our patients do, is to compensate for that weak glute muscles and to still be able to get that weight forward. Instead of getting the hip forward in extension, they bend at the hip. And that's something we want to avoid. Uh, knee, whenever we are loading the knee, try to maintain it in slightly flexed position. And then ankle, 
we don't want to have excessive plantar flexion. And I think a lot of times these patients who had a stroke may have spasticity in those gastroc muscles. And because of positioning, sometimes they lose the dorsiflexion range of motion. So very important to maintain dorsiflexion range of motion and avoid excessive plantar flexion. And sometimes uh, if your patient is really exhibiting that knee hyperextension and there's something that we tried everything and it's not working, we could possibly shorten the step length on the other side. And that would be a compensatory approach to reducing knee hyperextension if you're really worried about that or if the patient is really worried about it. Uh, so you saw this in the previous picture, but this is what this patient is doing is she really shortens her step length. So again, if you look at her hip, her knee and her ankle, this picture actually is pretty good. But then when you see how she takes a step and she's putting that other step forward, you see where her hip is, it's still far back. And what we really want to do is if we were able to bring this hip over here, have her trust on her knee and her ankle, we could possibly improve her step length on the other side. And so this is something that we really want to train our patients to do is be able to trust that side, be able to take weight on it while bringing the other leg or the uninvolved side forward. Um, other treatment approaches, uh, strengthen gastroc muscles, increase dorsiflexion range of motion, uh, strengthen the quadricep muscles. If somebody had knee extensive spasticity, maybe to give uh, uh, Botox injections. Uh, though the literature, um, there's not much literature which supports that idea. Uh, if somebody has hamstring weakness, of course, uh, doing some hamstring strengthening exercises, hip extensors, uh, proprioception, you could possibly use a Swedish knee cage, which is just like a three-point correction, which really helps with the knee. And it really helps the patient learn where that knee joint is in space. So that works really well if somebody had just like a minor knee hyperextension and they do also have like proprioceptive issues. And then functional task specific training. I think that's the key for everything that we do is uh, task specific exercises, intensity. Um, so step through gate uh, squatting. And when we are squatting, again, really want to make sure that there is anterior translation of the tibia and the patients are able to hold that over there. Uh, stepping down exercises. I really like step down exercises versus stepping up. I know we try to do a lot of marching and step up exercises, which are also good. Don't take me wrong there. But if you have a patient standing on a step and then I, I hold the tibia and passively translate forward while they step with the other foot, it really helps train that tibial translation while loading the joint. Um, just some of these other ideas are um, electrical stimulation. So you can do functional electrical stimulation. Uh, there was this uh, biofeedback. You can use electronic goniometer. Uh, some literature has talked about surgeries and then um, the Swedish knee cage um, ankle foot brace orthosis. So that has been a lot of mention about using an AFO with a dorsiflexion uh, assist, but a plantar flexion stop that can help prevent knee hyperextension. So going back to addressing the ankle, I think I mentioned all of this already. Um, so with the AFO, the reason we want plantar flexion locked is when the person goes from that loading response to mid stance, that's when our ankle in the normal goes from five degrees plantar flexion to about four or five degrees of dorsiflexion at mid stance. And that dorsiflexion at mid stance is very important because that's what brings that knee back a little bit into extension. And if the patient's ankle continues to be in that plantar flexion, that's when we lose out on that tibia going back. And if the patient don't feel comfortable there, then they're just going to snap that knee back, hyperextend, load it in hyperextension and take a shorter step on the other side. So that's why we want to have a brace which has plantar flexion blocked. In terms of addressing hip and trunk, definitely posture and alignment. Really want to have your patient try to keep upright posture, uh, maintain that trunk alignment, head and neck, um, everything. It's, it's a chain. It's a chain reaction, right? So if the 
head is too far forward, the shoulders are back, uh, it will kind of impact the trunk, in turn will impact the hip and knee and ankle. So really want to do uh, postural training in standing uh, position if we can. Uh, work with hip extensors in multiple planes, especially during load bearing. Uh, trying to do these kind of lunges, steps on a variety of different services, planes, using therabands, T-Rex straps, whatever we can to really strengthen those hip muscles and trying to maintain that trunk uh, posture while doing these hip exercises. Because a lot of times my patients might be able to stand up straight and they have a nice posture and nice weight bearing. But as soon as I start doing an exercise of the hip and they start doing a side step or a back step or a forward step and they just throw their body forward or back or sideways. So we really don't want them to do that. Um, knee, same thing, strengthen, strengthen, strengthen as much as we can. Quadricep muscles, hamstring muscles, um, really trying to do close chain exercises, uh, really trying to do exercises in the loading phase because this is where we want them to work uh, to help with that knee hyperextension. You can do squats, lunges, stairs, especially they're coming down the steps, ramps, uh, and then you could possibly use a Swedish knee cage if proprioception was an issue. With that, thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Great, thanks Nassim, as always, for such an in-depth presentation that was full of actionable insights that our viewers can definitely integrate right into their clinical practice. So many really good ideas in there. Um, I know our viewers will have a lot more follow-up questions, so I wanted to try to dig in a bit deeper on a few points. And to our viewers, feel free to add your questions to the comments below. So starting with the causes of knee hyperextension, I think one of the biggest takeaways is that the primary cause isn't just quad weakness, but generally a combination of a lot of contributing factors. Can you talk a bit more about some of the assessments that you might perform with a patient to help determine which factors are actually the biggest contributors to their knee hyperextension? Yeah, um, thanks Jill. And so a couple of different assessments is definitely start with observational gait analysis. Because when we start with observation gait analysis, we're trying to figure out again what's going on as a complex. So two takeaways. One thing is we need to kind of look at individual joint and what's happening during each phase of the gait. And then we need to look at how one is compensating because of the other's weakness. I think that's what is the big takeaway is I know what's going on at the hip. I know what's going on at the knee. And I know what's going on at the ankle. But figuring out because of my ankle, possibly lack of range of motion in dorsiflexion, how is knee and hip contributing to that problem? And then how can I address that knee and hip to overcome that problem? So I think it's a little multi-step process is first figuring out what's happening at each joint during that gait cycle, looking at the gait as a whole, but then trying to figure out is how these chain work together and I think one of the things that I do uh, which I mentioned before is I really try to take still pictures or if I take a video I'll pause it at multiple different phases and then with my own hand or a line or whatever you can try to figure out what's going on where where is a trunk where is the hip in relation to the trunk where is a knee in relation to the hip and then where's the ankle and then I might be like, okay, during this skate cycle, we really need her to bring the hip forward. That's the main exercise. So then one whole session, that's what we would try to do a lot is really try to address that thing. Um, the other ways that you could also do is if we think motor planning is an issue, there are a lot of different ways in which we can assess for motor planning, cognition. Uh, I feel uh, assessing for cognition also contributes to gait because again, we are trying to teach, it's motor learning, right? And so if somebody does have cognitive deficits, then it becomes harder for gait training. So assessing that also is important. And then going back to our basics, uh, goniometer and manual muscle test. We need to be very thorough with this. And one of the things that I didn't mention is the importance of ankle inversion and aversion. And I know we don't talk about that a lot, but that ankle's internal rotation is so important during gait cycle. Because during loading response, when the ankle hits the ground, it hits on the lateral surface. That's how that body reaction and everything works, right? The ground reaction. As soon as that loading response to mid stance happens, the ankle actually kind of pronates a little bit. 
And that's when the first ray comes in contact with the ground. And so many of our patients don't have that. So really kind of looking at that range of motion is important as well. Excellent point. Um, diving in a bit deeper into some of the mechanics of knee hyperextension specifically, you noted that plantar flexor weakness can play a key role in knee mechanics, particularly with control of tibial advancement during stance. Can you comment a bit more on the role of, that the plantar flexors play and some of the treatment exercises that you use to help rehab plantar flexor, plantar flexor strength coordination and or timing? Yeah, no, good question. Thanks, Jill. So plantar flexors, as I said, the biggest role is from loading response to mid stance. And then the plantar flexors also play a key role from mid stance to terminal stance to push off or pre-swing. But because this topic is about knee hyperextension, I'm only going to talk about loading response to mid stance. So for loading response to mid stance, what the plantar flexion does is, or the gastroc muscle does is, in loading response where the ankle is into five degrees of plantar flexion, in mid stance, the ankle comes back to dorsiflexion and that's where the gastroc muscle is the one that's bringing that into dorsiflexion. It's like eccentrically working to hold it in dorsiflexion. And if the gastroc muscle is weak or we have limited range of motion over there, the ankle will never get into the dorsiflexion during mid stance. And if the ankle is not able to get into dorsiflexion during mid stance, the tibia is not able to stay in that forward position. It's going to snap right back. So I think that's what the role of plantar flexion is in mid stance, or plantar flexors is in mid stance. A uh, couple of different treatment ideas that I do for plantar flexors are um, definitely seeing how strong they are. Uh, if your patient can do heel raises, I love doing that with all my patients. Um, and um, you can do them just bilateral because most of your stroke patients will not be able to tolerate doing it on a single leg. Uh, if I have a very high level patient, I will do them with a single leg uh, heel raises. That's the best exercise you have for your plantar flexors. A uh, lot of times I do them on, uh, I'm blanking for the word right now, but you know that the machine that we have for our quad muscles where we uh, push it, uh, what is it called? High back. Yes, thank you. Uh, but so instead of doing it on the knee, I just use the tippy toes of the ankle on that. And then you can do like a little plantar flexion stuff um, bilaterally. If you can, uh, that's a good exercise. But then a lot of it is in loading response. So when you have your patients standing and you can do a lunge step, so one foot is forward, one foot is back, and I manually will hold the tibia so I translate the tibia forward as your patient is taking load bearing on that leg while they're using the other leg to lunge step. Forward, diagonal, sideways, on a step, a variety of different surfaces. So those are some of the exercises for plantar flexors. Great, I love it. Nice variety there. Okay, <laughs> one last question. Um, so of course we know that knee hyperextension, um, now that we've heard all this especially, isn't likely to be the only gait <laughs> Gym that we're trying to address with this population. So what are some common pitfalls that our viewers should maybe look out for to make sure that they're not creating maybe a new problem somewhere else in the kinematic chain, such as propulsion asymmetry or something, while they're, you know, zeroing in and focusing on the hyperextension? Um, and I think that's another really good question. And I do find sometimes like, Sometimes when I talk about gait in patients with stroke, I think the two glaring things that people are always thinking about is knee hyperextension and then hip circumduction. And I think these are just very dramatic events that happen during the gait cycle. And so we are all just tuned into thinking about them, addressing them and how to best treat them. Um, I find sometimes, and again, because we're talking more about gait, its efficiency, the speed, the step length, really trying to make these patients walk more. Um, so I like to look at the ankle a lot, is what is the range of motion in the toes? And we need to have like at least a big toe, needs to have at least 30 to 35 degrees of extension if they are not wearing an AFO. Of course, if they're wearing an AFO, then we, that kind of nullets it. But if they're not wearing an AFO, I'd really like to get that extension 
in the toes, it really helps with that push off or the terminal stance. Um, the other thing that I said before is that ankle inversion. Aversion really needs that pronation on the ankles and sometimes patients uh, either have spasticity going on or they just don't have that range of motion there. Um, and then the other thing is the hip. Really trying to get that hip extensors to work, the hip abductors to work, because I think the stronger we can get them at the trunk and the hip. Uh, and not forgetting the upper extremity. I, I work with a lot of occupational therapists and I always say is, I know PTs like to address gait, but I feel OTs also help a lot with the gait, especially with the upper body posture, with the uh, upper extremity, uh, how they hold it, what position we can keep in. Because again, it's, it's a whole unit. So things can happen below or above and we need to work together to address this whole unit. Great, thanks for a great talk, Nassim. And thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. So thank you for having me here. And to our viewers, we hope that you have been finding these talks interesting and educational. Don't forget to reach out in the comments section with any of your questions or suggestions for addressing knee hyperextensions in clinical practice. Please make sure to also like and subscribe by using the buttons below and feel free also to use the comment section to suggest future talks or speakers that you would like to see. We hope you tune in again with us next week. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you.